Welcome to the C-Suite series presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC-registered FINRA licensed broker-dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. Of the 6,000 small and micro-cap companies listed on the site, today we're featuring the EW Scripps Company. Michael Kapinski, Noble Senior Research Analyst covering the company, will be interviewing President and CEO Adam Simpson and Executive Vice President and CFO Lisa Knudsen. As a reminder, Michael's research is available at no cost on Channel Check. Just type in EW Scripps in the top left company data section. And now, here's Michael, Adam, and Lisa. Well, I'm excited to have Lisa and Adam join me today. And so we're just going to go right into the questions. So Scripps has had a tremendous amount of success investing outside of the traditional broadcast business, and it's created substantial value for its shareholders over the years. You were early investing in cable, which was sold to Comcast, Network Cable, having launched HDTV and the Food Network. Now, most recently, invested in over-the-air platforms with Kate's and now the planned acquisition of Ion Media, which both appear to be growing pretty nicely. I, my question is, as you think about over the air, does the company worry that the growth of these platforms will be significantly disruptive to the legacy uh, business, of uh, your legacy television business? And is that what has driven you to uh, your interest in the over the air platforms? Well, Mike, I think the company, as you described, has a long history of creating value by always looking out over the horizon at areas in the media ecosystem where they see value being created. Um, we also believe that two things can be true at the same time, that we have a terrific business in local television. We expect that to continue to be a terrific business with opportunity ahead as that business uh, continues to develop. Um, but we also see that there is some secular pressure on that business and the opportunity for us to even profit from some of that disruption by looking into the over-the-air marketplace uh, to identify a growth marketplace for television uh, is core to the company's legacy and culture of uh, entrepreneurship and value creation. Well, you've been successful in doing that in the past. And I'm going to turn, I'm going to jump around a little bit here. So I'm going to turn to Lisa. You know, traditionally, the company has managed its balance sheet very conservatively. And now with the purchase of ION Media, debt levels will be at historic highs. And Lisa, in the past, I know the company has mentioned that it plans to be more aggressive in pursuing acquisition fueled growth, and that may take debt levels up. And that is certainly has happened. What is your sense of the new norm for the company's debt levels? And where would you like to see debt over the coming years? Yeah, thanks, Mike, and thanks for having us today. Um, you know, managing the company toward a strong, flexible balance sheet has been part of Scripps' ethos. Um, you've been around us for a long time and know that that's something that we've always talked about and certainly have run the company. Um, over the last couple of years, um, as we introduced um, our new strategy, we indicated that we would be willing to flex our balance sheet uh, in order to gain scale initially in local media uh, with the acquisitions that we've made over the course of the last couple of years. And now we see, um, again, with the acquisition of ION Media, um, a really uh, phenomenal deal. Um, and, and we saw an opportunity to put our balance sheet to work to create a higher performing and more economically durable company. Uh, you know, we will be at um, the higher end of our leverage um, targets. Um, we'll be at 5.2 times at the time that we um, close the eye on acquisition. Um, we expect to um, be able to delever um, over the course of the next several years, certainly with the high cash flows that we anticipate we will have with the eye on acquisition. Um, from a comfort perspective as a company, certainly we are more comfortable in um, somewhere in the mid threes in terms of leverage. Um, and so you will see us continue to work to delever over the course of the next several years. Given the significance of the current pandemic, it's, I'm sure it's caught everybody by surprise. What have you learned from the pandemic in terms of how you manage the business and how you are positioning the company to potentially manage through what could be another pandemic in the offing at some point in the future? Well, I think we've recognized, uh, first of all, that we were very well positioned to be able to navigate this period. Uh, the work we did last year to, uh, as Lisa described, sort of 
leverage our balance sheet a little bit in order to make the company more durable, I think put us in a really good position from a cash generation perspective, uh, having more number ones and number two stations, uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, operating a platform of scale ahead of the negotiation of retrans put us in a position to make sure our business was more durable. This latest uh, transaction will, uh, I think, enhance further the durability of the company. And at the core, I think that's what's important from an uh, economic perspective to withstand these unforeseen uh, events. Um, with respect to the operating business, uh, we have seen a lot of innovation and in entrepreneurship, a lot of creativity exercised across our company over the course of the last the last nine months. I'm incredibly proud of the work our teams have done um, operating, you know, not only in a work from home environment from a, a office perspective, but even our news crews and our broadcast teams, uh, you know, working every day in the field, coming back to their uh, homes, making sure that we were uh, focusing on the three priorities that we set out to manage against. The first being the health and welfare of our employees. The second being ensuring that we would focus on business continuity. And the third, uh, executing our mission, all the while being good financial stewards of the company. I think, we're, I think we've learned a lot of lessons as a result of those priorities. Uh, and I think we'll continue to execute against those priorities as we move forward. And are there were there some structural changes, Adam, or there, do you think that you're going to just kind of like as the the this issues with these pan, the pandemic, maybe with the vaccine and so so forth? Do you think we get back to the norm where we were before? Or do you think that there's a new norm? Well, I think there's a new norm that you know even benefits our company. I mean, to start with, we've seen increased viewing of our products. Um, more people are staying at home, and they're and they're really looking to home entertainment. And you know we are the original streaming platform, uh, both both now in the local markets as well as beyond. Uh, after the close of the acquisition of Ion, we will operate the most ubiquitous streaming platform, broadcast television. And we have seen increased ratings both in the local marketplaces where we operate with respect to the local news and the importance of the role we play in the local communities in which we operate. And frankly, at the Cates Networks and uh, at Newsy and at ION, we've seen increased audience size as a result of the stay at home orders. So, I, you know, I think people are rediscovering the value of gathering as a family on the couch and spending time together. And we have been there for them in the past and we will continue to be there. Um, with respect to structural changes, I think uh, from an economics perspective, we clearly see that there will be opportunities for us to review the way we uh, think about real estate, the way we look at um, even uh, the uh, employment uh, we have and whether or not we, we would be willing to be a little bit more flexible uh, in the way we um, structure our employment agreements or our agreements with our, uh, with our leaders and our employees, making sure we're able to really leverage the best talent available across the country uh, as we go forward well we're all adjusting to the the new issues that, with, that brought up uh, with the pandemic that's for sure um and and to be sure i really like the ion media uh, acquisition uh, but in the past the company indicated that it planned to make tv acquisitions largely to gain scale and then also looking at duopolies um, to have negotiating power for retransmission revenue and to have a better position against the big four networks in terms of negotiations on reverse comp. The ION media acquisition does little to strengthen the company's hand in those negotiations. And so should investors be concerned about the retrains revenue growth opportunities and margins for your legacy TV stations? No, actually, to the contrary, we set out to um, rejigger or to recraft our portfolio to get to about 25 to 30 percent of U.S. households. And last year, we did just that. And I would tell you, we came into this year with the opportunity to renegotiate 40% of our subscribers with that larger platform. And I would tell you, based on the results that we've, we've seen, um, I believe uh, it's been an affirmation of that thesis. So I'm very satisfied at the level of scale that we're operating with on the local, um, on the local side. On the national side, the acquisition of ION um, is an acquisition of the most scaled platform in, uh, in broadcasting. Um, I think it gives us now as a company adequate scale to operate in the local marketplace and certainly adequate scale on the national side as we continue to see the business develop into the future. And Adam, there are some industry projections that have traditional multi-channel subscribers declining over 9% in 2020. 
What are your thoughts about retransmission revenue in light of the prospect of declines in multi-channel subscribers? And, uh, and uh, you know, obviously there, some of those multi-channels are shifting to other platforms, but I was wondering if you could just kind of give us your thoughts about that. Yeah, I think I would say two things. First, um, I think there's continued growth ahead on the retrans revenue line as uh, broadcasters continue to work with the MVPDs to ensure that we're being fairly compensated for the distribution of our local brands, our local streams. That's another thing that we've seen um, happen during this pandemic, the validation of the importance that, uh, of the role we play in the communities that we serve. Certainly during the pandemic and during the civil unrest through the summer, it's been the local news operations that have really demonstrated uh, how, how critical a role we play in the local, um, in the local marketplace, especially as we've seen a real weakening of the role that newspapers are, are, are playing uh, as a result of the economic turmoil that the newspaper industry has gone through. Um, so I, I still see uh, a lot of opportunity for growth ahead with retrans. But I would also say as a company, we've always been comfortable in profiting from disruption. And certainly there is pressure on subscribers just in the way you described. And I would say the moves we've made both first initially with the Cates networks and now adding on ION to develop a business that really is built around the over the air marketplace is essentially another hallmark of Scripps' strategy to identify opportunity, even opportunity to profit from the disruption. So I don't think investors should be concerned about it. If I were an investor at this point, I'd be asking the companies that I uh, invest in, okay, so these secular declines, what are you going to do about them? And that's why we have been executing this plan. Well, that leads right into my next question. The Ion Media acquisition really propels the company into the league of the super broadcasters. They, you're going to be generating two and a half billion in annual revenues, over 100 TV stations. Many of your peers uh, have just recently announced plans to take advantage of that scale to launch their own programming. You dabbled in original programming in the past and still have some. With this acquisition, does it make it more likely that you will be more aggressive in developing original content? Um, certainly now you have the such a huge platform with ION that you certainly have that ability. Is there a favorable risk reward profile to make those investments? And would you consider national news programming that may, may even be able to leverage Newsy, for instance. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we already operate original programming with Newsy, which is all original content, all original news production, Court TV, which is original uh, court uh, and legal journalism production. Uh, clearly, uh, the Bounce Network does some originals. And on the local side, we really pioneered the idea of bringing back the time periods and in, uh, in early fringe from the syndication business and crafting uh, original programming for those periods where we saw economic benefit. I'd say our first goal with the acquisition of ION is do no harm, right? The ION business is a fantastic business. It's the fifth ranked network um, among all the broadcast networks. It's fifth ranked among cable networks and that's on the back of uh, an understood programming strategy that works with the syndicated marketplace to take uh, to take shows that are already really popular and bring them to the over-the-air marketplace and to the cable marketplace. So I wouldn't expect Scripps to be investing heavily or certainly not above where we are today with original programming on the ION side. As we look out ahead, we will always do you know return on investment analyses to determine the best way to create value for our shareholders. But for now, I think it's going to really be status quo at Ion as we continue to um, to, to yield the rewards of that very popular programming. And Adam, let's uh, talk a little bit about the new broadcast standard, the ATCS 3.0 that's being introduced. Are there revenue opportunities that you see? coming out of that rollout? I mean, how far into the future would that be? And is there a possible spectrum play given your substantial national reach now with ION data casting or spectrum that might be used for autonomous cars is always talked about. How far off in the future do you see this potential revenue stream? So a couple of things. First, uh, I think we really relish the opportunity to take a much uh, more significant leadership role with respect to ATSC 3.0 and value creation that comes from both that transition as well as through the use of Spectrum. 
As you described, uh, after the ION transaction, we will be the largest holder of broadcast spectrum. And I expect we'll put a lot of effort against identifying ways for us to leverage the advanced television standard and that spectrum, both for the benefit of the American people, as well as um, for the benefit of our company and our shareholders. Uh, I would tell you, we are already in the thick of the transition to 3.0. And the opportunities near term uh, focus more on the opportunities to enhance the uh, quality of the transmission, the programming, the audio that comes over the broadcast signal to be 4K, to be immersive audio. And a lot of those sets are already in the marketplace. And as more of those ATSC 3.0 sets are sold, we expect that really this company will be uniquely positioned to leverage all of our over-the-air assets to, uh, to super serve that over-the-air consumer. As we think about Spectrum going forward, we're absolutely focused on identifying new business models around advanced television, multi-versioning of advertising, the data collection that can happen as a result and the targeting that we think broadcasters will be able to do, in addition to some of the uh, uses you described. Uh, telematics and updated firmware for autonomous vehicles, in-car entertainment. That's why we're active in Detroit right now with our station lit up, working with the auto industry. Um, we expect that there'll be additional ways for us to leverage Spectrum to bridge the digital divide and bring connectivity to Americans that today are, are without connectivity. That's all of the work being done at Scripps in the background, but I'd put that a little bit further off. When we talk to investors, we're very clear. Near term, first we see the opportunity to do multi-versioning and advanced advertising. And then I think we'll see those new business models come as a result of innovation and entrepreneurship in the system. Well, it sounds like an exciting future. Um, Absolutely. Let's go back to the the core business. You know, core advertising has been challenged with increased competition from competing mediums. Do you feel that there is some unfair competitive pressure on this business? And to what extent does the potential regulation for tech companies, which has been talked about in Congress, does that provide some relief? And does the company support regulatory efforts to limit the power of the tech companies? Well, look, to, to start off, I think we, we believe that there ought to be a level playing field with respect to regulations. Um, I think, uh, you know, if we're going to be regulated as a platform for political advertising, for, for example, we expect that if political advertising is moving or is, um, is found on uh, technolo technology platforms, they ought to have to play by the same disclosure rules. Um, but with respect to, um, uh, you know, where we stand as a company, here's what I would say. To start off with, I don't think there is still a single other medium that is as effective for brands to get their messages across to consumers as television. And so while certainly we've seen um, search engine marketing and data-driven um, digital marketing take share, at the end of the day, there is no string of search terms. There is no data-oriented Facebook ad or Twitter ad or Instagram that has been proven to be as effective to tell the story that a brand wants to get across as television uh, advertising. And so as we look out across um, the horizon, we still think that uh, brands and agencies will continue to use television as the most effective medium to reach large audiences. Now, one thing I think that plays in favor of our company, frankly, is that as consumers cut the cord, as newer, newer audiences never even sign up for pay television and, and look to subscription video on demand, and the over-the-air bundle as their new skinny bundle, over-the-air television, both local and national networks like ION and our local affiliates will become the most important part of the marketing mix. We've already heard from agency heads and planners and buyers that at the end of the day, they know that over-the-air network television is gonna be a really important way for them to reach those cord cutters with those important brand messages. And regulation obviously is heavily politicized. Um, the Supreme Court has decided to hear arguments regarding the proposed FCC de deregulations of the broadcast industry. To what extent does the proposed FCC regulatory rollback have on the way you operate your business or possibly in your future acquisition plans? 
should the Supreme Court rule in favor of the FCC, does this have any significance to Scripps at this point? Yeah, well, first, I think it's important to say, given the transaction that we just announced and where our leverage is going to be, our first focus with capital is going to be on paying down debt. So when we think about sort of what's over the horizon, for us, it's a lot of debt pay down uh, based on that, um, uh, the work we've already done. Second, we have to see what the Supreme Court actually does. I don't think anybody is willing to um, uh, sort of forecast which way they're going to go yet. And it can go either way. But I would tell you um, the rules, the new rules as uh, laid out by the FCC do modernize a lot of the regulations around ownership. And I would expect that were we to have the opportunity to participate in some in-market consolidation, we would go back to the opportunities we described before around buy, sell, swap. We have been constantly, we have been very consistent about the opportunity for us to continue to improve the economics of our local media portfolio by looking at ways to leverage, you know, buying second stations in the markets where we already operate, selling mark stations where we uh, might uh, find a buyer that would be better suited for that uh, TV station or swapping into other, mar uh, into other markets or doubling down in other markets in order to strengthen the economic profile of our uh, local television portfolio. And I just have a couple more questions here. You recently updated your political advertising guide um, for 2020. Um, political is just a barn burner, it seems. You raised it from 200 million to over 230 million, I believe. Am I, am I correct in that that raise was really based pretty solely on what was booked in the third quarter? Well, for sure, we've seen a shift from um, historically, most of the uh, revenue and political going in late third quarter and in fourth quarter to now, we've seen political all year long. And so we had greater visibility, certainly, into what we were going to book in third quarter. And, you know, we obviously have a good sense of what fourth quarter looks like, too. So I think the number is reflected generally, reflective generally of our view that political is very strong. We expect to be north of $230 million um, and, uh, and feel really good about. Uh, about the way things are shaping up for the year. And finally, Adam, you announced today the expansion of Newsy's distribution on uh, Philo. I, I, hopefully I'm saying that right, an on-demand video streaming service. Will Philo be paying retrans on the carriage or, is, or are you just seeking a broader subscriber base to leverage um, the distribution for Newsy for, to go after more national advertising? Yeah, I mean, look, we have all sorts of different agreements with various MVPDs and virtual MVPDs with Newsy. Um, so I can't get into the details on Philo in particular, but I can say that our model at Newsy is really about being ubiquitous. So we've, uh, you know, we're, we're available in more than 40 million homes today in the pay TV ecosystem with Newsy. We're available on nearly all of the significantly viewed virtual MVPDs like Philo and YouTube TV. And we expect to continue to march towards that um, uh, sort of level of ubiquity because we, we expect uh, consumers to be able to find Newsy wherever they're looking for a news and information platform. Well, with that, I might have questions for now. Um, Lisa and Adam, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us a really detailed view of EW Scripps. Thank you. Mike, Mike thank you so Thanks, much for Mike. having us. This has been the C-Suite interview series brought to you by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Log in to Channel Check or subscribe to our YouTube channel to get the full catalog of C-Suite interviews and virtual roadshow channel casts. Register for Channel Check's no-cost premium content and receive notifications of new releases from both series. Thank you for joining us.